Good afternoon. Seems like we were just here recently, so welcome back. It's great to see so many docents, docents emeriti, our staff friends. We're pleased to all be together today. And it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Michael Morawski, who will be with us as our keynote speaker at the meeting today, and then, as you know, in workshops throughout the rest of the week. He comes to us through the special gift and generosity of someone that many of you knew, and uh, some of our newer docents, you might have heard of her name, but I'd like to take a moment to remember Jo Hamilton, who was a docent for many years, loved this museum, loved being a docent, loved art, loved travel, loved all of the above. I see her daughter out there in the back. If you could just wave your hand so we can all say hello and... And it's through the generosity of Joe Hamilton and her family that has instituted the opportunity to bring in specialists of all kinds and of all nature to the docents here at the museum. The docent advisory group helped us to determine who these people can be. And Mike is one of those people here. He comes um, quite well spoken of by docents at the St. Louis Art Museum. Um, through conversations with colleagues there and, and just recently with a couple of docents there, they have been singing his praises. And they were very sad that after four years at St. Louis heading up the school programs, he went across the country to Portland. And he has been there for two years now as the Director of Education and Public Programs. Mike's background is in art history. He um, studied undergraduate art history and history, and then through his graduate work, he studied arts education. So he comes to us very well-rounded and with a lot of great experience. It's been a lot of fun for me to, over the last couple of weeks, send him information about our collections, and he's been researching and being um, from around here, he's no stranger to this museum, so he had a good foundation to start with, but it's been fun to share some ideas and stories and share our great collections, and I know he's eager to get in there with you. So after today, which is a great moment for all of us to be together and to hear him and to think about what are our engagements with visitors, We've been spending a lot of time with school groups over the last year and a little more, and so now's a great moment to continue that thinking, but also to think about adult audiences. How are things similar? How are things different? So we'll be thinking about that um, once we get into the workshops. And if you haven't signed up for a workshop, there's still space in a couple of ones um, that you're more than welcome to sign up for. But we've got a great group. Um, great sessions to come, and so I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much. It's so great to be here. Um, I'm really honored um, that the generosity of Joe Hamilton and family um, can make this program possible. Um, a special thanks to um, Adam and uh, Rosie um, and also Judy Koch, who um, um, sadly isn't at this museum anymore. Um, she and I were friends and started talking back when she was head of education here. Um, and so it was uh, part of the conversation in terms of um, having me come here was with her as well. Um, and I know that she's missed here and I've, I've hoped to be able to stay in touch with her as well. Um, so thanks, go out to her. Um, and the Docent Advisory Group um, for really being uh, a part of this process to, to be thinking about um, what we are gonna be dealing with today and the next several days in the galleries has been so meaningful. Um, so thanks to Cindy and everybody in the group um, for, for that input. <coughs> um, so I'm, I'm not only honored to be here today speaking, but I think the thing that really excites me is getting into the galleries the next several days. Um, that's why I do this. Um, the podium and the microphone and all this is, is not the reason why I'm a museum educator. Um, and you'll find my, my uh, presentation probably pretty informal and casual as well as participatory. So uh, there'll be something for you to do during this. Um, and it's great to be back in Missouri. Uh, my uncle went to the Kansas City Art Institute back in the 60s, so we have Kansas City connections. Um, and um, walking here this morning in the rain, even though I'm from Portland, I didn't have an umbrella or a rain jacket, so I got drenched. Um, I think being in Portland long enough, I just 
the, the umbrella doesn't even happen. We just embrace the rain, we get wet, and we know it's gonna happen. Um, but I love that they're having thunder, you're having thunderstorms here because that is probably the number one thing I miss about the Midwest is we don't have any thunderstorms in Portland. It just rains a lot. Um, and so this morning when there was the big thunder boomers that came through, that really made me excited. So being at the Nelson Atkins for three or four days and being able to see a thunderstorm, I'm, I'm set for several years now. So <laughs> um, let me see if I can get my slides up. There we go, I think. Yay. Um, and if, I, if at any point um, I move back from the microphone or if I'm speaking too fast, that's my number one flaw, um, is if I have too much coffee, sometimes I'll go too fast. Just shout out and say, slow down, or get closer to the microphone, or further away from the microphone, um, and I won't think anything of it except for to, to do that. So um, the, oops. there we go. Okay, um, so the title of the talk that I sort of pulled together was, how do we connect engaging adult audiences through gallery learning? And it was kind of difficult for me to figure out what to title this um, because we're dealing with a lot of different types of questions and issues and, and wondering about a lot of different things. One of my thoughts was calling it school tours, not just for kids anymore, um, because a lot of what we'll be thinking about, especially when we're in the galleries, is um, what are some of the strategies that you have in your toolbox, especially through the last couple years of really thinking about thinking in the galleries and creating that culture of thinking in the galleries with school tours. Um, because I think so much of that can transfer right into the experiences with adult audiences. Um, it's something that I've been doing myself in the galleries for about eight years now in terms of making adult tours participatory um, and have been leading docents, educators um, to sort of do that more with adult audiences. Um, but we decided, I decided to stick with the sort of how do we connect title because I think when it comes down to it and I just, had a lot of time, and this is why I really love this invitation to come here, is it pulls me out of sort of the daily work of being director of education, and it forces one to think a lot about these issues that I think all museums are struggling with right now. And I think when it comes down to it, um, it's all about making connections, and not just for visitors, but for us, between uh, the museum and visitors, between the community and the art that we have in our collections. So I think this how do we connect, this big question, for me at least frames a lot of the different issues that we'll be talking about. It is fairly abstract, but I think we can tie this all together um, fairly well. Okay, so before we dig in, I'd like to get to know you a little bit better, and you're probably thinking, how in the heck is he gonna do that? Um, I'm gonna ask you some questions and I need a show of hands for some of these basic ones, just so I can get a sense of the room, as a comedian would say. Um, how many people in the audience have been a docent for longer than 10 years here at the Nelson Atkins? I haven't, but I'm, okay. How many, there was a new class that recently graduated. How many of you were in the new class? Fantastic, so I trained two new classes when I was at the St. Louis Art Museum and a colleague of mine said when I was training my first class, you never forget your first docent training class, the group cohesion, um, and she was exactly right because I still am in touch with those individuals. Um, how many people in the room were born in Kansas City or the Kansas City area? Okay, all right. Um, and how many of you are teachers or have been teachers in the schools? Fantastic. How many are lawyers or have been lawyers? <laughs> I'm just curious. And this question I'm particularly interested in. How many have been involved in the medical profession at some point? Nurses, doctors, anything? See, I always find this. Every museum I go to, um, that is a strong connection between the medical profession and um, and being docents. In St. Louis, we had lots of docents that were nurses, and I thought it created a wonderful art side manner in the galleries. Um, it was really, so there's a strong correlation. Every museum I go to, I went to the Crocker, the Sheldon, uh, the LACMA, and said the same question to docents, and I always get about a third to half the group having some involvement with the medical field, so. Um, the next thing that I wanna do is a little more uh, sort of pushing you a little further. Um, we're gonna, what I wanna do is learn a little bit more about you and sort of how you're thinking about art in terms of touring. And it's gonna be works not from your collection, so you don't have to worry about judging something that's in your galleries. But what I want you to do is use your arm to be a barometer. So, um, you know, if I'm gonna show a slide and you'll actually be able to see. I'll use the first one. So with this object, what I'd like for you to do is put your arm in the air, and if you'd love to tour with this one, you put your arm towards this side of the auditorium where it says, would love to tour with this. If you would avoid this painting, if it were on view here at all cost on the tour, put your arm towards the other side of the room, this side of the room. So give that a try really quick. 
if you would, I imagine, yes. Like, who's, the, but there are a couple of people who are like, well, that would be so hard to teach with, and it's a masterpiece, and how would I do that? Um, okay, I've got a couple more. This one, this Ellsworth Kelly. Would love to tour with it, not so sure. Avoid it, okay? I'm getting a little bit more crossed action, so. And this piece, which is an enormous case of formaldehyde with a shark submerged into it. Would love to, ooh, I love this. This might be the, the group that's most into this piece that I've seen yet, so. Um, I just wanna to tour with this with a middle school group, middle school boys, that's all. I just wanna have this, yeah, I just wanna have this on view when I have that middle school boys tour. Um, well, thank you for playing along. Now a little bit more about me, um, and, and thank you, Helen, for that great introduction. Um, but I always try to share a little bit more. I think museum education is about human beings, and if we don't get to know each other, then we can't actually get to the craft of the teaching and the learning. Um, so this is a picture of my five-year-old son, Holden. Um, as of now, he loves art museums. In fact, so I work at the museum all week and many, many weekends, um, and we get to a Sunday where I don't actually have a program, and he says, Daddy, Daddy, let's go to the art museum. And I'm like, oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> um, but I don't say that, I don't say that. I say, yay, we'll go to the art museum. And it's always amazing. It's always, um, this is, we were doing some drawing in the galleries, and you know, gallery that was way off the beaten path with some contemporary Northwest regional art. And um, so he's drawing in the galleries, and every time a visitor came in, he would hold up his drawing and say, I'm an artist, and he'd like run up to people in the galleries. And so we had to figure out a way to have kids stationed throughout the galleries, I think. Um, but, uh, but being a father is a big part of my life. Uh, my wife is actually getting her PhD in um, art history from Washington University in St. Louis. So uh, we, we sort of have fallen from the same tree. Um, the middle is the Portland Art Museum in Portland, Oregon. Uh, when I got the job, a lot of people asked me about how the lobster was, and I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm in Portland, Oregon. We have incredible beer, incredible wine, and all kinds of food, but the lobsters get shipped from Portland, Maine. <laughs> Um, I, I run, um, I, I only mention this because of, I think, this sort of community of museum education that is now existing through conferences, but also online. Um, there's a website called artmuseumteaching.com that started out as my own public reflections on doing like what we'd be doing the next three days in the galleries when I was in St. Louis and we did docent workshops or I had a teacher workshop. Um, I just wanted to have somewhere that I could write about it and share it and reflect about it. I didn't care if anybody was reading it. Um, it turned out a lot of people really wanted to read that. And so now it's got 50 contributors from museums all across the world um, writing about practice and reflecting on what we do in museums. And there are a lot of really direct teaching tools and teaching strategies on that site if you're interested. Um, I don't care if you visit it, that's not why I'm mentioning it. Um, but it's part of sort of my own practice that's expanded outside of just my role in the museum. Um, on the lower left, if you can see the image, I realize it's pretty far down there, um, is a picture of me. Uh, I grew up in St. Louis, I'm from St. Louis. And it's a photograph of me at Lohmeyer Sculpture Park, which is where my parents' house was adjacent to Lohmeyer Sculpture Park. Um, and I didn't think much of it until recently that that was a really formative experience with art. I didn't visit an art museum until almost college. So it wasn't one of these. My parents, when I got a job at the St. Louis Art Museum, I worked there for four years. My parents lived in St. Louis. They did not come to the museum once. They were just, it's just foreign to them. They never had any exposure to that. Um, so I didn't really have a lot of exposure to that, but we lived next to this incredible sculpture park. If you've ever been there, it's, it just keeps getting better and better. Um, so climbing around sculptures was sort of my formative experiences with art as a child. Um, St. Louis Arch, and then on the far right is um, a photograph that uh, is when I was uh, director of school services at the St. Louis Art Museum. Um, I really loved working with the docents at that museum, and I was glad that some of them said kind things about me um, because that is hard work. Um, um, because I think if you, you know, put that much passion into it, um, you're in the galleries a lot and you're on task a lot. And I think it makes the person that works with docents a really, really good museum educator because you're working with all kinds of people, such a diverse group of people. And St. Louis, just like here, has such a range of people that are volunteering and committing their time. So that's kind of a piece of me. Um, as long as I'll, if I work for the Portland Art Museum the rest of my life or other museums, I'll always go back to the time at the St. Louis Art Museum. It's, it's my hometown museum, so it's kind of my museum too. 
And then just a couple, I'm a quotes person, and one of the things that the St. Louis Art Museum dotes, docents always say about me, and now the Portland Art Museum docents, is that I'm always bringing quotes. Um, so I thought I would bring two of my most inspirational quotes. One from Marsha Tucker, who was former director and founder of the New Museum. This is probably the thing I think about the most. Um, she says, I see art history and museums in particular as a process, an interface, a tool, an agent provocateur whose role rather than being didactic is to get people to see and think for themselves. That last part is just golden for me and I think about it all the time. If I have a mantra, it's probably that. Um, how do we get people to see and think for themselves um, so they don't rely on museum interpretation and museum education all the time, that they can actually visit any museum and take something that you've transferred to them and take it with them. I think that's really powerful. And then the other one is um, Mark Rothko, Barnett Newman, and Adolf Gottlieb wrote something um, back in the 40s, and an excerpt from it was, to us, art is an adventure into an unknown world which can be explored only by those willing to take the risk. And I love that risk part. And I have said this quote many times when I'm in the galleries with docents, teachers, even like fifth graders, um, you've got to take that risk and try something different. Get out of your comfort zone. And I think when we get out of our comfort zone, our audience is much more likely to try something out. Um, and so that can be a really fun part of, of being an educator in the galleries. Okay, so a little bit about the Portland Art Museum. Um, Portland is a crazy place. <laughs> and the art museum is particularly creative, innovative, experimental. It's one of the reasons that I really wanted to be out there and be a part of the team there. Um, this is a photograph from opening night of an exhibition we did last summer called Cyclopedia. It was an exhibition of iconic bicycle design. Phenomenal collector from Vienna. We showed this, uh, these bicycle designs. It happened to open on the same night as the World Naked Bike Ride, which attracts <laughs> Every summer that happens in Portland, and it attracts this, this particular year, last summer, it was more than 10,000 very scantily clad people riding their bikes, which I, I have not done, and I don't think I ever will. Um, it just sounds kind of painful and uncomfortable as well. So we had, I think, like 1,800 nude visitors to the museum that night. And the thing that surprises me the most, this, you'll, you'll hear this again and again, I think, is how much they were really, it was, that night, more was learned about bicycle design, I kid you not, than any other night of that exhibition. They were really paying attention. We had um, people that volunteered to be there that night. No one was forced to be there that night, uh, but we had staff and volunteers who were there answering questions about the bicycle design. We had bike guides um, that knew a lot about um, some of the bicycles that were there, and they said, man, all the whole night they were having conversations with people. As long as you didn't look down, you were okay. Um, so we've done a lot of kind of crazy experimental things, but I think it always, this is something that's core to me, it's core to our director, um, and I think it's core to all of us in the room. Um, it, it always really comes back to art, but art is so powerful, it can do all kinds of interesting things. You can do so many playful things around art and still have that focus be the center, even though some of these things might seem like they're getting away. It's always interesting that people allow these to be experiences that get you back to art. Um, this is our object stories gallery. It's a project that's now in its fourth year at the Portland Art Museum. It's all about community connection, community voices in the galleries. This is an exhibit of, uh, we had Art and Music in Venice, which was a traveling show, uh, a major special exhibition, mostly 16th through 18th century. Uh, had paintings and instruments and things about music. And these are, Portland has one of the largest period instrument communities in the country. So we got to pull from local instrument builders, people who were studying Baroque music, musicology, um, and bring them all in, show their instruments, show their process, and sort of have them be a part of the interpretation of this exhibition. Um, so it's something that we've been really passionate about, bringing those voices um, into this gallery, into our tours, into our experiences. Um, and then um, another kind of crazy thing, and I'll keep this brief so I can move through these fast, but we did an event recently in uh, June called Art and Beer. We had five brewers brew beer inspired by a painting in our European collection. Um, it's called The Drunken Cobbler by Gruz. Uh, great painting, one of our best European paintings in the collection. Um, and again, on the night, we had three to 400 people show up. There were beer tastings, and each brewer, some of them who had majored in art history, um, they mind this painting. What were people drinking in France at the time when this painting was made? What were the pigments made of? How can we get the beer to match the color of that brown drapery or that clothing? It was amazing. And so we had 400 people in the auditorium, probably about this size, 
um, listening to the curator, the conservator, um, and these brewers talk about this painting. And when the event ended, our curator, Dawson Carr, who um, has been a curator for many, many decades, he's sort of finishing his career in Portland. I'm glad he is, because he's wonderful. He expected the gallery to be empty. It's like 7.30 at night. We figured everybody would go home. So he thought, oh, I'll walk over to the gallery. He walked into the gallery, and there were over 120 people in there looking at the painting and talking about the painting and noticing new things about the painting. Um, so it was amazing that these types of creative experiences can really uh, continue to drive a lot more attention. Um, and then finally, this is a, a group of our new docent class at the Portland Art Museum. We're calling it Docent Remix. Um, it's a way for us to bring in docents into the group that have jobs during the day, but still just really want to be involved with the museum. And they're, do, they're going to be, after about a year, they're going to be doing a lot of weekend and evening adult tours. And so I was thinking a lot about them as I was thinking a lot about you and how we might be having these conversations in the galleries in the next couple weeks. Um, at the Portland Art Museum, we're thinking a lot about adult audiences and how we can make that public tour the thing that people are waiting in line to get. Um, and I think that museums can actually get there um, if, we, if we rethink a little bit about how we're engaging these adult audiences. Um, so whenever I talk for a long period of time, we always have to have a palate cleanser, and I call these art moments. Um, and I also wanted to do an art moment where we look at something that would also share a little bit more about where I'm coming from. So what I'm going to have you do is... Um, this is a piece that was recently acquired into the Portland Art Museum's collection. And all I want you to do is quietly just spend a minute, I'm actually going to time it, and just look at it as best you can from where you're sitting. I'll get out of the way. Just kind of visually explore <clears throat> the piece in the time that we have. Okay, now what I want you to do is turn to someone sitting next to you, oh, have, turn to someone sitting next to you and just talk about what you saw, what you noticed. Very simple. You've never seen this piece before. What are you noticing in this piece? Find someone near you and talk about what you're noticing. Okay, this is the hardest part, right? When you've got excited looking happening. Whenever I've done this before, I always tell everyone that sound you just heard, that's like the stuff of museum learning is this chatter and I mean, you're all oh, excited and looking and, I, and that's fantastic and I love that. Um, it's hard to stop it, right? If you just let that go on for a, for a long period of time. Um, the next thing I want you to do with this work um, is best we can, I know you're spread out in sort of some awkward places, is to either use a finger or a hand. Sometimes it's best if you just use your hand. Point it at an area of, it's uh, um, the, the sort of black lines, I'll just call it that for now. Wherever your eye lands, just kind of put your thumb, a finger, your hand, wherever you want to land. And then what I'd like for you to do is just take some time and just trace within those black lines around the piece, almost like a mouse uh, going through a maze um, and just spend some time. You can even retrace areas and just explore this physically for just a minute.
Okay, so now partner back up with the people you were chatting with before, and I'm gonna give you one more minute. This time, is there anything new that you noticed? So you had just a brief moment to sort of physicalize some of these spaces in the paint in the in the piece. Is there anything new you notice? So just chat with your neighbors again about anything you, that you might have noticed now. Okay, thank you very much for this art, art moment palette cleanser. Um, this piece, oh, that's my computer, that's my computer. It's going to sleep on me. Um, it didn't get to look at the art, so it's not interested in it. So, um, so this is a piece that, I'll tell you a little bit about it, um, because it's the reason I chose this piece specifically, because it continues to share a little bit more about me and about the Portland Art Museum. Um, the museum has, um, I don't know, I say arguably, but I don't know that anyone's argued with me yet. Um, one of the best collections of Northwest Coast Native American art in the country, certainly probably one of the best collections in the world. Um, Canada has many, um, and there are some collections in the US that are really phenomenal. Um, but we have the Rasmussen Collection, and we're doing a lot of work collecting new pieces, as well as assessing a lot of the old pieces that we have, the traditional pieces. Um, this is a contemporary piece by Clarissa Rizal, who's a weaver, and I got a chance to go to Juneau, Alaska, where she works. Um, this is a photograph of our curator, Dina Dart, Native American curator, um, Wayne Price in the middle, who's an elder, um, who attended this event in Juneau, and then Clarissa, uh, who is Wayne's uh, daughter-in-law on the right side. She's the artist, the weaver of the piece. Um, and so not only did um, I get to go to Juneau where the piece was, it was worn in a canoe ceremony and delivered to Dina, our curator, um, on a muddy sandy beach, which was really great to see a, a very expensive work of art that we had commissioned being delivered to our curator on a muddy beach. We were standing up almost to our knees in mud on the beach. Um, we said, don't drop it, don't drop it. <laughs> um, on the right, we, I got the extremely rare opportunity if not, I'm probably one of the few white men who has been able to see a um, uh, Tlingit Chilkit weaving workshop, which is for women, and it is for Native women. Um, and so there were two things that really would not normally allow me to be in this process, but because we were from the museum and we were really using it as a way to learn more about this piece, um, they invited me to be part of the workshop, which was amazing. Talk about connecting, which we'll talk about here in a couple minutes, connecting to the piece in such a big way. Um, when this piece goes on view in the gallery, which I don't think it will till 2017, um, it's going to be a really powerful experience. And then it was danced in ceremony on the left. This actually isn't a picture of the same Chilkit robe on the left, um, because we were, I was videotaping it while it was being danced so we could capture that. Um, but this is an example of some of the dances that we saw in Juno as part of this celebration, which was amazing. Um, and the one thing that I really wanted to share about the piece is when um, Clarissa Rizal was at this workshop and she finished it, someone said, how do you feel about this piece going to Portland to be in the art museum versus staying here in your community? And she said, if, um, because she had like a car accident during making this piece. She finished it, she had no feeling in one arm and she finished the weaving. Um, it it's, was an amazing story. Uh, it's called Resilience Robe and I know why. I'd never have to question the title of the piece. Um, she said if the piece was gonna stay in her community, she said, wow, it's amazing. It's, it's so much of me goes into it and it stays here. Um, but she said, it's the, she, and she, you know, we commissioned this piece, but she said when it goes to the Portland Art Museum, I lose a piece of me and a piece of me goes away, and a piece of me leaves this community. Um, so it's something that we're working with actually closely with the community to make sure that it can go back periodically. We're, we're trying to be um, 
really, really um, collaborative with the community about that. But that was something that really sunk into me and it made me think about this work of art way bigger than looking at it or seeing at it, seeing in the galleries. It had this whole new perspective on not even just how museums work with native objects, but just the human, the spiritual side of this object. Um, that's much more than just looking at the piece. Um, and these context images that we will share with visitors, including video and all kinds of stuff, hopefully we'll bring that to them. So kind of back to this idea of how do we connect um, visitors, communities, art, ideas, people. Um, one of the things that I wanted to note before sort of diving into one way of processing this idea of how do we connect um, is that museums are changing. Muse I mean, I've been in museums, working in art museums now, um, and my first job was head of education at the uh, Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University in St. Louis. So my first job was head of education, which they were insane. They should never have hired me for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and people have been making insane decisions ever since. Um, but for eight years, um, I've been in on fantastic conversations with colleagues in museums, not just education, but curatorial directors across the country. Um, got to go to the Association of Art Museum Directors this past June, which few museum educators get to go to because we're not invited to it. Um, and museums are changing right now. I mean, across this country, across the world, I think, but especially in the United States and North America, um, they're really thinking about community. They're really thinking about how can a museum be about its place, not just in its place. Um, and after talking with staff here, but also just knowing um, about Kansas City and about Missouri and Kansas, um, you know, this is a great institution um, that's thinking about that. And, and that's been a sea change, I think, in a lot of museums that are thinking much more about how do we connect with visitors? How do we think about how to listen to visitors. Um, so that's been a big part of the change in museums. And what's important to me to say is that uh, docents are a key part of that. Um, when I was, you know, during the eight years that I've been in museums, I've talked to a lot of colleagues in museums that have gotten rid of their docent programs or, and hired staff, or maybe um, one institution got rid of all its docents and decided to hire a whole new group of docents. And, um, and I always shake my head at those institutions because I think they're missing out on what really makes docents this incredible, valuable resource for museums, which is that community connection, um, is that ability for people like yourselves at all of these museums, you know, not only are docents connecting face to face with more visitors than probably any other interpretive resource that we create. Um, you know, one in 10 general public people, I think, are interacting with docents. And when you get to school students, that number skyrockets um, in terms of that face to face interaction. Um, and so docents are this really core part and volunteer educators are a really core part of this change in museums. <clears throat> and so these conversations, when I presented at the National Docent Symposium about three years ago in St. Louis, that was really, really important to me that we were having conversations with docents about the changes happening in museums, not making changes and expecting you, kind of like a, a water skier or something, to be following along, oh, I gotta go this way and now I gotta go this way. So I think thinking about this together is really important for me. This is something I value greatly. Um, I did in St. Louis, I do in Portland, and in the next several days, um, I hope that we can have really great conversations in the galleries about the really important role that you play in getting you know, adult audiences and visitors so psyched about the Nelson Atkins and just wanting to come back and explore and bring their families back um, because I think that we can continue to do a better job with that. Um, a colleague of mine at the Portland Art Museum talking about our museum said to me, isn't a museum only as good as its worst tour yeah, think about that. <laughs> um, and I, I paused for a moment, um, and then I said, you know, you're, you're, you're probably right, because for those people that take that tour, that's the museum to them. That's, you know, that's how powerful this relationship can be that you're making with whatever age, if it's a family tour, if it's a school tour, um, if it's an adult tour. Um, and so I think working really hard to make sure that we're building these connections, that's that word I'll keep coming back to, um, is important because I really do think that a museum is only good, as good as its worst tour. Um, so, so I think museums are really thinking a lot more about that. The way that I wanted to frame, I'm gonna try this, uh, the way that I wanted to frame this idea of connection is actually through a, um, an idea that came out in the Chronicle of Higher Education only a couple weeks ago. So this is something that I was quickly thinking about. I'm gonna try it out today. Um, it was an article called Thinking Bigger Than Me, Bigger Than Me in the Liberal Arts Education written by Stephen Tepper. He is Dean of Art and Design at Arizona State University. 
and he, and he has this short piece um, that you can Google and find um, where he talks about about 10 years ago, there was a big crisis of arts attendance, arts participation across this country. Um, and it, it got people thinking a lot about how do we respond to that. But he was noticing at the same time as, as arts attendance dropped, people's involvement with creating and making increased. So for example, because of the internet, not only could you make music, but you could share it with millions of people through YouTube, or you know, there's tons of websites out there now, but even 10 years ago, there were hundreds of sites where you could be a musician and share your, your creativity with a lot of people. Um, he calls this eye creativity. He was a big proponent of it about 10 years ago, but this is an essay where he reflects back on it and wonders whether these experiences, which are really about an individual, he calls them me experiences, um, whether we really need to think about moving past them. Um, and he calls these me experiences, uh, market, or he's marketing researchers call them I-W-W-I-W-W-I-W-I. I want what I want when I want it. <laughs> and I think um, to sort of, and then he talks about bigger than me experiences. And I'm gonna talk about both those ideas here in a second, but I'm gonna reframe them. Um, for him, bigger than me is, is getting outside of just your own making of music and being part of a community. Um, having empathy with others, learning about others' perspectives. Um, and I think that's when I started to, to think his ideas were a little sticky for me, and I liked that, and I wanted to learn more about it. Um, the twist that I put on it is, I think he has a negative perception of me experiences. We hear a lot nowadays about this millennial generation growing up that I'm not sure if I fit into it or not, but I, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Um, but that it's a me generation and a negative connotation. So, you know, it's, it's about, you know, selfies and quick, fast experiences. The internet has sort of trained a generation of people to not take the time and think things through. Um, and I think I would twist that and say that I think these me experiences are actually an incredible foundation for us to build on here at an art museum. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why I think that. I think these me experiences uh, that Stephen Tepper talks about they're about individual voice, expression, and you see um, a couple selfies on the top. I think they're really good selfies too, really creative ones. Um, and on the bottom, there's some students, and they're, they're drawing, but they're doing it on their own. They're having their own relationship with that work of art um, in the galleries. So it's about individual voice and expression. It can be about making an immediate personal connection, so something is either immediately relevant and you learn more about it, or it doesn't connect with you and you move on. Um, thinking about questions like, what is this to me? Which for me has been a really important question in museum teaching. What do I have to say as an individual? Um, these me experiences, I think they, you know, if we started thinking about what, what we might have experienced, they're fast, they can be entertaining and fun, they can be a quick activity in the galleries that gets people just sparked. Um, and they, they often do, and, and Stephen Tepper talks about this, they do involve making and doing, um, but sometimes they don't go beyond that. So you made something and you put it on the wall and that's kind of the end of the experience. Um, I think these things are positive and things that museums should be pursuing. I think museum selfies are fantastic and we could debate that a long time, I'm sure. Um, but I still love when a visitor shares their experience of the museum. The Portland Art Museum has a really strong Instagram feed, which is a social media way of sharing photos. Um, so does the Nelson Atkins. And so I was looking through the Nelson Atkins feed and there was a, a photo shared of a docent tour saying thank you to the docent, which was amazing. There was a proposal in the galleries um, posted on Instagram. And then just lots of people out with the, you know, outside in the lawn with the shuttlecocks or the teepees, um, just sharing their experience to the world. And I think that's a positive thing. I don't think it's just a, a quick, hey, I'm gonna share my experience and then move on and, and go eat McDonald's. I think it's really, it's a place that we could run with a little bit. Um, and the, the way that I think we can run with it and build on it is through these bigger than me experiences. And these are more about um, reflection, maybe contemplation, although I chose the word reflection specifically. They're about struggling with ideas, uh, asking meaningful questions. So if you're leading a group, how meaningful are the questions that you're asking? And we'll talk more about that. Um, what if questions, envisioning questions, questions that might not have an answer. You certainly might not know the answer, but there might not be an answer. They might just be about different perspectives. Um, uh, a lot about process, so not always coming up with a product, but more about the way of getting there. Connecting to others. Um, empathy is a really important one. 
Um, when I was working with uh, school and teacher programs, I went to a Harvard Project Zero conference, and it's a big think tank around art education. We had about 300 teachers in a room, and I had a chance to ask them all some questions. And one of the questions was, what's the most important thing that they want their students to gain out of school? And we kind of set the curriculum aside, and they said empathy. They felt like their students, and I think this can you know, span into some adults these days, <coughs> um, need to build more empathy sometimes. So I think this is something that Stephen Tepper talks about that I also grabbed onto, um, which is wound up with these connecting to others, adopting um, or uh, recognizing other people's perspectives, um, and then the shift in context. So sometimes taking something and putting it in an um, unfamiliar context or making juxtaposition so that someone's asked to think outside of the box um, can get to bigger than me experiences. I typed this whole slide up um, a couple days ago and then I think it was two nights ago I was thinking, what does this really mean for tours? Um, you know, this is all well said, but, and then I added that last thing, which is all these bigger than me experiences absolutely require you to be in a group. I was just thinking this morning, like, oh, I'm gonna go to the galleries and I'll do, I'll find an object that I connect with, I'll take a selfie with it, that'll be my me experience, and then I'll have a bigger than me. How am I gonna do that? I was like, I need to have someone to talk to, I need to have someone to build meaning with, I need to have someone to show me something I didn't know, give me a new perspective, um, maybe change the viewpoint that I have on a certain aspect of the world. Um, that could have definitely happened in the Plains Indians exhibition, that sort of bigger than me perspective. Um, I did have some conversations, but I would have loved to have had a group just sitting in those galleries talking about a lot of the complexities that are on view in that, in that space. Um, so I think group tours is the perfect way for these bigger than me experiences. You have to be in a group of people to have these things happen. So, um, so kind of with that, that's kind of my, my attempt to play with these ideas of me and bigger than me experiences. And we'll talk about these when we get into the galleries the next several days. So those of you that are gonna um, come in for the workshops, um, I wanna follow up with some of these things. And here's how we're gonna think about these things. Um, this next couple things are a little bit of a preview of what we'll be doing in the galleries. But for those of you that aren't gonna be able to make it to the galleries, I wanted to give at least a little bit of um, what we're gonna be covering. <clears throat> so um, one of them, in the Abstract Expressionism Gallery is really focusing on this idea. And these are ways that I think we can start to think about building on me and bigger than me experiences and make connections. How we search for objects, that can involve both how we open up visitors to make that search for us um, and find the objects they're interested in, but also um, searching for objects that can have more stickiness for our visitors. Um, selecting artworks that open up multiple perspectives, have certain levels of ambiguity, so there can be a conversation about different ways of thinking about a work of art. Those are gonna work really well to build towards these types of experiences. <clears throat> thinking through new context, bringing something um, outside of the art context into the galleries can be really successful to think about that. Um, and then adding visual Velcro. This is an idea that someone from um, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art talks about, Peter Samus, um, adding as many hooks as we can to these works of art. And I think um, sometimes we think about that in terms of interpretation, audio guides, touch screens on the walls, but I think in our context, we are gonna be the most successful at adding those hooks because we're a person, we're an actual person they can talk to. Um, and so we can add that visual Velcro to a piece. So when we get into the galleries, I'm actually gonna open up the research process that I've done um, with works that are on view here, but and talk a lot about how you can research a work and harness that divergent power of research, not honing it down to the right answer, but how can we actually learn more about a work that will open it up to lots of different ways of approaching it. I think that's so key um, as we start to think about making connections in the galleries. Um, and you'll notice the background or the security guards didn't get too mad when I leaned forward to take these details of works in our collection in those galleries. Um, <clears throat> the, the workshop that um, is gonna take place in the Dutch 17th, 17th century painting galleries um, is about questions. I think that's something that um, I'm really drawn to is how do we ask questions? What, are they, what response do they evoke? How do we get visitors to ask questions to us and to the group? Um, I think is a really important question that I wanna explore a lot more. Um, we can draw out these connections both to make that personal me connection, but I think questions that are really meaningful and structured really well can actually get us to some of those bigger than me, connecting to other people, connecting to other ideas. 
And we talked about those what if questions. There's a lot of creative questions that can be asked of a work of art that help open up those types of experiences. Um, simply creating a safe space to wonder. Um, W-O-N-D-E-R, although I like the other wonder too um, throughout the museum. But making sure that people, we create a culture of thinking and wondering so that when people come to the museum, the biggest fear that I think adults have when they walk through the door is, gee, I hope I'm not wrong, or I hope I know enough about that. Um, I know that when, um, when I was in St. Louis and we had an abstract expressionism exhibition on view, we talked to a lot of visitors who said that when they walked in front of a Jackson Pollock, they felt broken. They just didn't get it. And it was like, you know, that's, it's not about that, um, it's about we should be creating an environment where you feel free to explore that work um, and not feel like you need to know the answer and like run to that label and read it and be like, oh, okay, now I, I still don't get it. Um, because labels don't often help those people get it. Um, and I think that sometimes if we get that conversation into just open exploration of work like that, um, that, can, that can be make the museum the safe space for wondering. There's um, a golden rule that we'll, we'll do some work with in the workshop uh, golden Rule for Developing Questions, and this came fr comes from Nina Simon, who um, wrote the book The Participatory Museum, and who is now director of the Museum of Art and History in Santa Cruz, um, someone who I have a lot of respect for. Um, you know, I don't agree with everything she's probably done, but she has pushed museums in a great direction to think about how we engage with visitors, especially communities and adult audiences. So her golden rule of questions is you must, you, the asker must be truly interested in the answer. If you don't care about the answer, then why on earth would anyone else? And I think that's a great rule for questions because I'm not gonna ask you to do this now, but think about how many questions that I've probably asked, that you've probably asked where it's like, well, I know the answer to that question. So if I asked, you know, one of the tests is if you ask 10 people in a row the same question, by the time you get to that 10th person, are you still interested in the answer? Is it that open-ended of a question where it's gonna be different for every person than it is, if it's gonna be the same question? Um, you know, stereotypical, bad question um, that is, you know, can anyone tell me the name of the artist? Well, if you asked 10 people in a row and they all knew the answer, it would be Picasso, 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 Picasso. And by the time you got to like six or seven, you'd be like, stop, I don't wanna hear any more Picassos. Um, so it's an interesting way to sort of test um, questions. She also does a test with questions where, um, do people have an immediate answer to it? It's one way to think about, you know, how are people gonna have a quick answer to the question? Or is it more of a question where people are gonna be like, I don't know, what do you mean by that question? Um, or are people gonna get what you're asking for? So when we get into those galleries, we're gonna talk more about that, but I love this golden rule of questions. And then finally, creating conversations. It always sounds so basic and duh to me, um, but it can be so hard to create honest to goodness, real conversations with real people in the galleries. Um, people don't come to museums expecting conversation. They expect to listen to you talk to them. Um, adults still, just to, museums have worked for 100 years to train people to come to the museum for information. Um, and I think it's our job, museums are better than that. And we can do a much better thing than doing that. And so I think it's our job to think about how can we create these conversations that can get them to connect with these objects, connect with these cultural um, items um, in this different type of way where we can learn about a lot more than just that single object. So conversation is learning. I mean, there's been research now for 50, 60 years that talking with each other is learning, way more effective learning than just passively listening. Um, so utilizing some of that research to keep things moving forward. Um, creating an environment, as I talked about with the wondering, that promotes conversation, sharing, and listening. Um, that is one of the things that I think is so key about conversation is teaching ourselves to listen better. Um, and then being aware of structures of engagement. We're gonna talk more about this when we get into, this workshop will be in the Chinese Furniture Gallery. Um, and that's the detail in the, pack, in the back of that canopy bed, that beautiful piece. <clears throat> but these structures of engagement, um, I wanted to briefly mention here um, before, I, before I finish. Um, because it's such a simple thing to think about in terms of how we engage, especially with adult audiences in the galleries. This image, I hope that this isn't here. I just pulled these images from the internet. Um, I always am worried that I'll go to some museum and use this image and it'll be their chief curator or something and he'll be sitting in the back and, or it'll be a, a docent or an education staff member and I'll be like, no, I, don't mean, I don't know you, I don't mean anything by it. Um, in this picture, in this gallery, this, this, is, this is a very interesting gallery talk. I have no doubt these people 
are completely enthralled with what this person's saying. I don't think this is a bad thing happening. Um, but are, is, are they setting up an expectation for conversation by just the way they're structuring the space of the gallery and where people stand, sit, where the person is um, you know, standing in front of the work of art? Um, for some reason, you all know this, there's that bubble around a work of art that people feel like they can't enter. And so sometimes it's just making people feel comfortable that like, yeah, you know, you don't want to get closer than a certain distance, but you don't have to stay 15 feet away from the painting. You can actually get a little bit closer. Um, this structure of engagement looks something like this, where you have, you know, an educator, you've got questions coming to you, you are the facilitator of all dialogue. It's coming through you. You might paraphrase it back to someone else. If someone else has something to say or a question, it comes to you. So it's very one directional talking and listening structures. Um, and it's kind of the way a lot of museum education happens. Um, I've done it tons of times, um, and I will probably continue to do it to a certain extent. Um, <clears throat> this picture, however, is very different. Can you even tell who the docent is or the educator? Some people are saying no. It's harder to tell, and I love that about this photo. It took me so long to find a photograph of a tour where everyone seemed like they were on a level playing field in terms of the conversation, the looking. Um, the woman in the white blouse behind the pedestal, behind the pod, um, case there, is, I'm assuming, a docent or a volunteer or an education staff member, um, leading this looking experience around the sculptural object. So we have this sort of circle, this structure of engagement that is much more conducive to conversation. We've got pathways for talking and listening happening between anyone in the group as well as with the educator. It doesn't matter if the educator's involved. And then thirdly, and this is where I'll sort of stop with this because there's a lot of different ways to think about this and we will when we get into the galleries because um, we'll do these things. Um, we'll actually model this. One that I've been really fond of in terms of having conversations, especially with contemporary art or more complicated subject matter, is this idea of a talking circle. So, you're not, so the work of art isn't even in the circle. You're just using the gallery and the works in the gallery to have really meaty conversations about ideas. So it might look something like this. This is a um, Nikki Lee contemporary photography exhibition um, when, at one of the museums I worked for. <clears throat> so we're sitting in a circle and we're talking about the work and some really, really big ideas about the work. Um, this is also in a contemporary exhibition about war and identity. So a big group of people sitting in the middle of the gallery and the the structure of engagement is very open to conversation, very open to ideas, people challenging each other's ideas. Um, okay, before I wrap up, I have one more palate cleanser because as I can tell as I look out into the audience, you're like, okay, he's been talking for too long. Um, so this, I wanted to do this palate cleanser, another art moment. Um, this is a work of art that is not in the Portland Art Museum's collection. Um, it's, it's something that none of us are necessarily familiar with. Um, and I want you to, to do a certain looking exercise with it. Um, so this is the work, hopefully you can all see it from where you're sitting. I want you to look at the work and you can jot this down or you can just take mental note of it. I imagine most will take mental note. Um, what are 10 things you notice about this painting? So just on your own in silence, sort of notate 10 things that you notice in this work of art. And I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. And if I was in the galleries with adults, I would say, take out a pen and write down 10 things you notice about this work. Because I think sometimes forcing them to do the school tour thing is, they might be like, huh? But they love it. They love it. It always is successful. Um, so what I want you to do is just very quickly, this is going to be even less than a minute, just pair up and talk. I want you to just process this for a second. Um, talk to that same, maybe that same person you were talking to quickly again about what were some of those things you noticed with this piece, and then I have one more thing to you, for you to do with this painting. So share with the person next to you what you noticed, and we'll move forward.
okay. I was able to jump out and have a little bit of conversation because I, I always feel left out when I just stand up here. Um, and this is such an interesting work to look at. So the next thing that I want you to do, and usually when I would ask this question, it might be a couple steps further down in a gallery experience or a tour stop. So it wouldn't quite be this quick, but you're all pros, so I can jump ahead, right? Um, I, wanna th I want you to think about, just for a, a moment individually, just in your own mind, I want you to think about what this person might care about. What this person might care about. The, the figure in the painting. What this person in the work might care about. And now I want you to um, connect back with the person that you were talking with about as you were looking with, and, and sort of share, or maybe even um, come up with something together as a, as a pair or a trio, um, something that this person might care about. And you can take that question however you'd like. And then we'll come back in a minute. All right, there we go. Save. Okay, thank you all for, now what I wanna do, cause this is, I can't resist this. I really is, I'm gonna pop down. I wanna hear a couple thoughts, a couple shares from, from different pairs that were talking about this in terms of what this person cares about. If you wouldn't mind sharing some of the things that you were talking about. Um, I think in a, this is a pretty big group, but I'm gonna do the best I can to sort of facilitate just a 30 seconds of that, so yeah. Thank you. 
sort of could be a dancer that hears a lot about his clothes because he's very stylish. I like that. Um, sort of this sort of sleek form of the outfit and stuff. <laughs> One more, all the way to the back, and then I'll come back up. You want me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, first of all, I don't see an Adam's apple, so I don't know how you can assume that it's a male figure. Yes, so I take it as a female with a male body who has had something very difficult happen and she's not sure how she can proceed. So she's sort of meditating about it. Her feet I don't see in a royal pose, royalies pose. I see it as one foot tempting to move forward, the other hanging back, one arm pushed back and one arm thinking about moving forward. Yeah, that male female comment is interesting because Kuan Yin is one of those figures that has that sort of um, multiple roles. Right? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great comment about the form and the pose because you can spend a lot of time digging into that and thinking about what that picture cares about. Um, so I'm going to definitely, we can do this for a long time, right? Because you love this and I love doing this. So this is a really great work. But, um, I want to say it's the president of Alibaba. I'm sorry? <laughs> Don't you see it's the president of Alibaba? <laughs> I won't ask the question, does anyone know who the artist is? I'll just tell you, it's Mark Rothko. <laughs> Interesting. The last time I did this painting was um, at the Crocker Art Museum with a group of docents, and at the end, someone came up to me and said, so you were kind of disingenuous. You hid that information from us. But when you were in the galleries, would you talk about who the artist was or would it? And I said, well, I, knew, I know that this audience knows. Mar that's, a, that's a sticking point. That's a, that me experience or that connection. Um, when I say this is Mark Rothko, we could now have a whole other conversation about this piece. Um, I heard comments about space and there's something strange going on with sort of the flatness of some of these shapes and strong geometry. Um, and so a little drop of information like that doesn't end the conversation, right? That actually is like, oh, because you know, you have that prior knowledge that I know you have, um, or many of you do, um, to sort of take that and go in different directions with it. Um, so thank you for sharing those wonderful comments about this painting. It's a, it's a, a self-portrait, um, an early work that Mark Rothko did. It's, a, it's just beautiful, and it's a, I think it's a small painting, so blowing it up this large just kind of distorts it. Um, so just, I'm just going to wrap up with some concluding thoughts um, and, and then we can, um, we, have, we can spend time with each other and chat and I'll, I really can't wait to get into the galleries because that's the environment that I enjoy the most because we can do what we just did in small groups with works in your collection, um, which is what I'm really excited about. Um, but just a con some concluding thoughts in terms of this idea of, of human connection. Um, when I think of museums, I think of them as human-centered. Um, and I know there's a, there's a debate out there as to whether they're object-centered or human-centered. I don't think they need to be one or the other, but I think they're more human-centered. Um, and um, well, uh, and, I, and I have lots that I can talk about in terms of that. One of the, um, one of the moments when I started to really realize that they are, museums can be more about humans than then specifically about objects was a story that a docent at the St. Louis Art Museum told um, after I started working there, uh, Joanne Sanditz, who was a docent there, I think now probably for over 40 years. Um, she started back when the Junior League was in charge of leading docent tours at the Art Museum, which is common with many museums. Um, and she must have started when she was 12 because she's, still, she's probably got 20 more years of being a docent in her. And she was the docent who was scheduled for the public tour on the morning of September 12th, 2001. And she um, t retells the story about how she didn't know if she was even gonna go to the art museum. They did, she didn't even know the museum was gonna be open that day because um, they didn't get any communication about it. But she went anyway, the museum opens at 10, the tour basically starts right at 10 o'clock. So she got there 15 minutes early. She figured if nobody was there or if the museum was closed, she'd, she'd go home. She had family on the East Coast she wanted to be thinking about. So she gets there 15 minutes early and um, at, at the front steps of the museum, which is similar architecture to this building, uh, there was a huge group of mostly businessmen. Um, they're in their suits. They had worn on the plane that landed in St. Louis and they were not at home. And so she went up to them and said, why are you here? And they said, we didn't know where else to go. 
And so I think stories like that, and I think that's not a, a story that's isolated. I think there are a lot of stories like that um, that prove to me that museums are about something really powerful that is very human and about these human connections that we can make, um, that objects facilitate, that objects are incredible and have a strong role to play, um, but that museums are really human-centered at their core. Let's see if I can get these slides to go forward. Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> Good to lighten up the mood a little bit after that story. Um, and I think making connections can be about slowing down uh, sometimes, spending more time with less objects, looking closely and seeing differently. Um, Wynton Marsalis, when asked what the purpose of jazz is, said to listen differently. And I loved that, and I've always connected to that, and thinking the purpose of, of art museums, the purpose of looking at art is to see differently and to see the world around us differently. Um, this is an incredible work of art that we did a lot with at the St. Louis Art Museum, and I think it's an illustration of all these different types of experiences you can have um, that dig at a single work of art. Let me see if this is gonna advance here on me. So you can have um, group conversations and looking like we've done here today. Uh, a scholar, art historian, talk to you about that work and add more context to it. This is John Klein, who's a professor at Washington University have sessions where you're drawing it, whether they're quick 10 second drawing sketches or drawings or more elaborate drawing sessions. Uh, this is actually works of art created in response to the piece. These were docents at the St. Louis Art Museum. We had a printmaking workshop and they created works of art in response to things in our collection. So they made their own works. They kind of made it their own. And I really loved that about it. This was a college student who decided to do a ballet workshop with the Degas Little Dancer. So we got that happening in the galleries and people got to dance and then look at the sculpture, which was another, it's kind of that um, idea of taking it out of, I mean, it still dances its context, but how many times when you're looking at a day god do you do a, dance, a ballet workshop in conjunction with that? And then finally we had a really interesting project where we took, the, we took questions asked by Degas about art and had visitors answer them, which was another really interesting way to have a conversation with Degas is what it was called. Um, and visitors loved it. They had little sticky notes and we just had this panel and we had visitors stick sticky notes onto it. Um, but just a really creative way. There's that quote again uh, by Rothko, Newman, and Gottlieb. That is not me, but that is a, uh, someone jumping off the ICA in Boston. They have the uh, world champion cliff diving competition off their rooftop into Boston Harbor every year. Um, so I think it's always a good image to show utmost risk and disregard for <laughs> everything. Um, here is a workshop that I led at the High Museum in Atlanta with the Jackson Pollock painting from MoMA's collection where adults were dancing the painting. Um, and it was a really amazing workshop. We, we did all kinds of creative things. Uh, this is a group um, crowdsourcing their questions. So they got to write questions down for works of art in an exhibition and then they got to choose which ones, they voted on which ones were the ones they really liked the best, which ones were the most meaningful to them. So that helped me answer the question of what they wanted to hear the answers to. And then um, sometimes reaching out and listening to the community in terms of their needs. This was a project, um, again, just kind of making this larger point about museum and connections um, where graduate students at the St. Louis Art Museum were asked, what do you need most today? And then they were asked to follow up with that in terms of how the museum could fit that need. So this um, young woman named Hannah uh, said she needed an engaged community. And I always keep this photograph because I thought that said a lot about you know, this sort of millennial generation really wants connection. They want to be engaged with their community and with their museum, and we need to be able to make sure that we can make that happen. Uh, making connections is about building community, collaborating, learning about each other, digging down deep inside and pulling out our imagination and creativity, making, moving, interacting, and feeling. And while it certainly brings us in direct connection to artists and objects, it's also about making them our own learning about ourselves, our society, our identity, and who we are as human beings via those incredible works of art in our collections. So with that, I think just thank you so much for having me here uh, today. I'm looking so forward to getting into the galleries and kind of getting messy and really working with you all. So thank you so much. Thank you. Now I'm really looking forward to these workshops. I think it'll be a great way to spend three more days. So, um, 
as we go ahead, said, I want to tell a story about a friend of mine who attended the 60th wedding anniversary celebration of her aunt and uncle. And the couple was asked, as people always are on these occasions, what is the secret to your long life together? And her uncle looked over at his wife, and they shared a long moment. And then he turned, and then he said, well, we never got a divorce. <laughs> so I am not up here to talk about marriage. But that speaks to me a lot about commitment, and especially commitment as it pertains to us. So I know every docent here understands the level of commitment that our service requires. And whether you've volunteered here for two years or over 50 years, you continue to honor that commitment and connection to the museum, to our visitors, and to each other. So I'm shaking this up a little bit, and today I want to first recognize the nearly 160 years of valuable service of docents who retired in the last year. And um, as I call your name, please come down to the front and we will recognize your service. However, the first person I'm going to call is Priscilla Brown, <laughs> who I know would like to be here with us, but she is in Arizona. So she's retired and moved down there, but she was with the class that started in um, 2009. She says, and I quote, I cannot fully express the, pres the pleasure I derived from the education I received and the fellowship I experienced at the Nelson Atkins. So we remember Priscilla, okay. Um, Jean Dalton, is Jean here? Was she able to make it? Okay, Jean Dalton retired after 27 years. She called me, sent, sent me an email, and said that she had another um, commitment this afternoon. She's helping in the public school system with an art teacher. And the art teacher, was, she knew that needed her services there. So that's where she is this afternoon. Um, Debbie Cox, is Debbie here? I think I saw, did I see Debbie? There she is. Oh, Debbie, you're going to have to come down. <laughs> no, you're not by yourself. <laughs> Debbie, after 27 years also, and you can wait if you want. You'll wait till the others come down. Um, but she did say, it seems like yesterday that I had many art history books spread out across the dining room table. I was so excited to learn about art at the Nelson. I also felt energized by the excitement and questions of the students. How wonderful it is to share art with enthusiastic docents who traveled, studied, read, and shared ideas. Okay, I guess Debbie is going to wait for um, Ruth, but you know, did I see Ruth? Is she here? Ruth, okay. Ruth, how are you? I didn't see you back there. It's wonderful that you're here. Would you like to come down, or would you rather have us ex recognize you up there? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What? It's a little too cumbersome. Okay, that's fine. We all know that Ruth is there, and we'll have a chance to visit her with her at the reception. Now, Debbie, you still have company. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I, oh, I will say what Ruth said, and we did honor Ruth for her 50 years last year, but I do want to say that um, she has a quote here, I have enjoyed and appreciated many opportunities to learn, to serve others, and to be surrounded by some of the major art works of the world. Many of these privileges I shall miss. However, a whole host of beautiful memories will live with me forever. So, Betty Lillard. 52 years. Okay. I spoke with Betty the night before she wrote her letter of resignation. And so this is what she had in her note. Talking with you, meaning me, last evening made it somewhat, underlined twice, easier to write this letter. To resign from the docent program after more than 50 years of service, pleasure, and great friendship 
is not done without emotion. So, Betty, can you come on down? <laughs> come on down. Okay, go back, go back with Helen. I mean, with Helen, Helen, you know what, Betty? Yeah, go back with Ruth. <laughs> Sorry. An incredible group. Thank you so much. I think you have to wait for a picture. Yeah. While they're doing that, I'll go on. Selma Cantor was a docent who served in the 1960s. In her memory, her husband donated funds for certificates to be awarded to docents who have achieved particular milestones in their years of service. So another milestone and a docent that I want to recognize with 40 years of service. Leslie Herman, come on down. Oh, it is? Oh, okay. <laughs> Leslie said, as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to share the joys of learning with others, not just the so-called facts, but the whys of what is around us and how we can try to find those answers. Being a history teacher, it was a nice transition into the art world, which, with its beautiful and challenging objects, I could make richer the search for answers. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Okay, for 15 years, class that started in 1999, with 165 years or more of service, uh, Ruth Biggs, Cheryl Cordes, Diane Fetterman, Laura Flanagan, Dan Karp. Okay, I'm sorry, Dan, but we will get your picture also. Donna Hudeman. Okay, Sir Tiller Bot. Jean Levy. Not sure if Jean is here today. Oh, good, Jean, you made it, good. She was coming in from out of town. Lois Mall, and I think Lois is in Turkey. That would have been a long commute. <laughs> Jody Olson, Jenny White, and me. So excuse me while I go for my photo op. I also want to remember a classmate of ours who is Kay Dolson, and in her honor and her memory, we know that she was very involved in many community activities and being a docent was 
very close to her heart, so we remember Kay today also. I want to acknowledge the five-year mark for the class of 2009-2011. Um, Selma Cantor Awards are given for milestones of 10 years of service or more, but I think a five-year mark is a pretty good milestone. So if you all would like just to stand and remain standing and be recognized for your service, we appreciate that so much. Thank you. And I did uh, send an email to Lorraine Frazier and heard back from her this morning. Thought that you would like to know she is continuing her chemo, but she loves getting cards from you and keeping up with all of our activities. So we remember her today, this afternoon. Well, I think every year that we complete is a milestone. So everyone else stand up and stretch for a little bit because I got a little ways to go, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, Helen, got the winner. Okay, you'd like to sit now. Can't give you too much time here. We've got to get out and drink. <laughs> Well, since we are so immersed in Plains Indians exhibit right now, I took a few liberties and made my own winter count <laughs> to help illustrate the year of, and this is the year we're talking about, May 1st, 2013 to April 30th, 2014.